Let me tell you a tale of two continents. One in the Atlantic, called Atlantis. Another in the Pacific, called Lemuria, or Mu, M-U for short. 25,000 years ago, these two continents were battling each other on the ideology of the day. Look at them as the two largest children on the block and the two highest civilizations. At that time, they both had two different ideas about which direction civilization should go. The Lemurians felt that the other less evolved cult cultures should be left alone to continue on their own evolution scale. The Atlanteans believed that all the less evolved cultures should be brought under sway by the two evolved ones. This caused a series of a wars between Atlantis and Lemuria. In these series of wars, thermonuclear devices were used. And when the wars were over and the dust cleared, in reality, there was no winner. The outback in Australia, the Mojave Desert, parts of the Gobi Desert, are all, and the Sahara, are all remains to remind man of the futility of this type of war. During the wars themselves, people, highly civilized, stoop to quite low levels. But they too, at the end, they realize the futility of such behavior. Lemuria and Atlantis itself became the victims of their own aggressions. Both the Lemurian homeland and the Atlantean homeland had been weakened by the wars. Thus, they knew that in about 15,000 years, both of their continents were going to sink completely. The Atlanteans had their second set of cataclysms, which reduced Atlantis from a large continent to a series of islands. Lemuria, in essence, did somewhat of the same. However, you might say, well, what did that, why would the people be upset at that time for something that was going to happen 15,000 years in the future? In those days, people lived for 20, 30,000 years commonly. They understood many of those who caused the havoc would see the end of the destruction. Then Lemuria, which went down first, almost 200 years before Atlantis sunk, they petitioned the Agartha network. The Agartha network is a network of subterranean cities that is guided by a city called Shambhala the Lesser. Well, to distinguish it, from Shambhala the Greater, which is the etheric Shambhala over the Gobi Desert. Shambhala the Lesser was created when the continent of Hyperborea was vacated after Earth lost her mantle and the planet started receiving radioactive waves that they had not been victim to in the earlier times. 
So they started building subterranean cities over a hundred thousand years ago. When Atlantis and Lemuria petitioned to build subterranean cities themselves and to be accepted into the Agartian network, they had to prove to Shambhala the Lesser that they had learned the lessons of aggression, that they had learned the lessons of war. And they also had to prove it to many other agencies, such as the Confederation, which we will go into a little later, because Atlantis and Lemuria had both been members of the Confederation. And when they started their warlike efforts against each other, they were expelled temporarily from the Confederation and had to prove that they had also learned the lessons of peace to be allowed to be members of the Confederation again, to be accepted into it. And Shasta, which is where the Lemurians chose to build their city. California was part of the colonies, part of the area of the Lemurian lands. And they understood that Mount Shasta and those areas of California would survive the cataclysms. Mount Shasta already being a place of great sacredness on this planet. They chose to reroute the lava tunnels from Shasta itself so that the volcano would not erupt again. And there was already a very large domed cavern within it and they decided to build upon that and they constructed the city that we now call Telos Telos was the name of the whole area of much of what is now the southwest and much of what is now California it was originally called Telos which meant communication with spirit oneness with spirit, understanding with spirit. It was constructed to hold a maximum of two million people. When the cataclysms started, only 25,000 people were saved. Many had been brought to Telos before the cataclysm started. But when the second set started in Lemuria, the volcanoes started erupting so fast and sent so much debris into the air that where they had intended to try and save at least a million people from the Lemurian mainlands, they were only able to save 25,000. Thus, that was what was left of the Lemurian culture, the Lemurian mainland. Already the records have been brought from Lemuria to tell us. Already the temples had been built in Telos. While Lemuria, or what was left of Lemuria, mainly Telos, was coping with the aftermath of the destruction of their continent, the earthquakes continued. During these earthquakes, the earth shook so hard that in many, many places, they went right off of what you would now call the Richter scale. When a continent sinks, the whole planet reacts earthquakes that reached the equivalent of what you would call a 15 point. These earthquakes were so intense that many people died from the sound of the earthquake, not from any effect of the quake itself, such as a building falling upon them or something, but a quake of that high of intensity created a screech through the atmosphere that killed many people simply from the sound of it. 
many other places. The earthquakes were so intense that in many places where the, the earth was mostly clay, it liquefied and acted like a sea of mud, swallowing whole cities, whole cities on the Lemurian mainland, but on many the planet. Another thing that came after that, as the continent itself went down, was so large that sometimes they went not just hundreds, but a thousand miles inland. The equivalent of a tidal wave starting on the coast of California and completely taking out Oklahoma City. Tidal waves like that run rampant as well as the earthquakes. In many cases, and in some areas, the shaking never quit. There would be a constant swarm of, if not large ones, then small quakes. The hierarchies, the councils of this planet, understood this was going to happen. So they tried to construct both cities prior to the destruction of Lemuria itself, understanding that the Atlanteans would not get a lot of construction done under those circumstances. Also, at the same time, the Great Earth, the Great Pyramid in Egypt was constructed underneath the toolage of the Lemurian high priest, better known as Thoth. And the Atlantean record chambers, which were geared to hold not only Atlantis's records, but Lemuria's, Pan's, Og's, Hyperborea, all of the other cultures that have existed and reached high levels upon this planet. The Atlanteans moved into their city at just about the same time Lemuria sunk, moving in first their priesthood, their greatest scientists, some of their greatest thinkers to try and preserve their lives against the coming cataclysms. Atlantis itself started shaking at the same time Lemuria was going down. And Atlantis continued to shake and lose parts of its land for 200 years before it too finally went completely down. For almost 2,000 years after the Atlantean and Lemurian catastrophes, the planet was still shaking. To lose two huge land masses within 200 years of each other, plus the planet was still witnessing the effects of the thermonuclear weapons that had been used in the Atlantean Lemurian Wars. Plus the fact that so much debris had been thrown into the atmosphere that it never became quite bright daylight for almost 300 years after Atlantis's destruction. This caused many, many life forms, plant forms, to go extinct. Plants that were common in Atlantean times, common in Lemurian times, that no longer exist because they simply couldn't survive the long stages of filtered sunlight. Some have survived, yes, many animals and plants. The human condition in those civilizations that survived it, Egypt, Peru, Rama, better known as India, 
in many places people became so frightened by the constant earth activity that civilization even in the last bastillions started deteriorating very very fast one question I have heard again and again is well if Atlantis and Lemuria existed how come there is not more evidence on the surface of that that is why most of the cities were shook to rubble those that were not shook to rubble were wiped out by the earthquakes or wiped out by the tidal waves even those who survived even the tidal waves even the earthquakes hunger was rampant disease was rampant some areas of civilization like those future named Egypt and such did survive they even kept their civilization intact but even they started losing the highest elements of their civilization many many machines quit working because of the filtered sunlight many many people moved from the cities they started feeling that living in a city was a death trap because you never knew when a building was going to fall on you what would look like a very strong building have it go through three four hundred earthquakes it's a goner some buildings were built to withstand it the great pyramid withstood the earthquakes but it was built with sacred geometries other buildings like that throughout the planet survived but most of the cities were completely reduced to rubble in many areas they rebuilt the cities but even then each time the cities were rebuilt it was on a slightly less should I say technology each city was a little more primitive than the city of before it the Atlanteans moved into their city which was built underneath the Mato Grosso plateau in what is now Brazil which had been Atlantean territories at that time I mean getting an understanding of what was happening on the surface you can perhaps understand how the Lemurians and Atlanteans would prefer to be living underground during this time there was an integration more and more with the Agartha network as I explained earlier Agartha is a confederation of several subterranean cities as a matter of fact there's over 120 of them some of them that were built in the very early times such as Shambhala the lesser which is peopled with beings from Hyperborea these are 12 foot tall beings being as man on this planet as on many other planets in this solar system was originally of a height of about 12 feet when we lost the mantle and started reaching more and more rays from the planet or rays from the Sun to the planet that we were not used to coping with it caused change within our bodies already by the time Lemuria and Atlantis sunk man had gone from 12 feet to 7 feet thus the Atlanteans and Lemurians were around 7 feet and still are and as you can see there has still been a lowering of the height 
on this planet. Thus people have gone down to now for the foremost less than six feet. We have lost over a whole foot in just 10,000 years. However, that trend is starting to reverse itself and as our spirituality is growing greater we are slowly returning back to our original heights on this planet within the Agartha network the cities that are allowed to join are only those that are based on light principles only those that are based on love only those that does not hurt only those that are based on non-aggression pate. Within the Agartian network, besides Telos, which is the capital, there are four more cities, for instance, that are based on Lemurian technology and Lemurian ideas. One is called Rama, which is underneath India. A Rama being the original name of India. The Rama culture is consisted of people that are almost pure Lemurian before the so-called Aryan race entered India. The other two cities that hold an allegiance to Telos but are very independent are Uyghur cities. One is called Shonshi, which is under Tibet, not too far from the capital of Tibet. It is being sheltered from the surface by a Tibetan lamasery. This is a Uyghur city. Uyghurs are a group of people that left Lemuria 40 to 50,000 years ago and situated themselves throughout much of what is Asia, India, and Central Europe. The second Uyghur city is called Xinhua. Xinhua is in the Gobi, or should I say under the Gobi Desert. This too is a Uyghur city. On top of the Atlantean city, which is called Posited, the one underneath the Mardi Gras Plateau, there is also another Atlantean city just a little farther north and there is another Atlantean city that is underneath the Atlantic Ocean and several other smaller satellite cities throughout the planet. As I said, these are all a member of the Agartha Confederation plus there are several independent cities that are not a branch of any of the larger cities that have simply built subterranean to escape things that have happened on the surface. Some pre-Atlantean Lemurian disaster, some post. The city itself, Telos, as I said, is built under a dome, a dome that reaches quite a few hundred feet from floor to ceiling and spreads across most of what would be the base of Mount Shasta. Looking from the outside, the top of the dome is about halfway up 
the mountain. The bottom of the dome is just about even with the base of the mountain. Underneath that are five more levels that had been constructed. These levels take up a space so that the deepest levels are about a mile below the ground level at Shasta. The rest of the city is built on five levels of several square miles across. These levels are divided up by usage. The top level, being under the dome itself, is where the main part of the city is. This is where the majority of the people live. This is where the public buildings are. This is where most commerce takes place. The second level down is where manufacturing takes place, some classes take place, and also more people live on. The third level down is totally hydroponic gardens where we grow all of our food supplies. The fourth level down is half hydroponic gardens, part nature and part manufacturing. The final level down is what we call our nature level. This is the level that is more than a mile in some spots below the ground. In this level, we have created lakes, tall trees, park-type atmospheres. This is where animals live. We have had animals underneath for so long that they have lost their aggressions. That and different temples, priests and priestesses worked you might say, with their ancestors, removing the need of fear. Since it is fear that creates aggression, not only in humans, but also in animals. Thus, we truly have the experience of lions lying down with lambs. In the nature levels, this is where people have come to relax. This is also where we have saved many animals and plants from extinction. More on side two. In these nature levels, as I said, many, many plants and animals have been preserved from extinction by being placed within the nature levels of Telos, Posited, and many other of the subterranean cities. Thus, we do still do have many of the plants that have been extinct on the surface. We still have saber-toothed tigers. We still have macedons. We still have your provincial dodo bird. We don't have dinosaurs. They were a little big to keep. However, some dinosaurs do still live in areas of the Congo and areas of the rainforests in the Amazon. Plus there are many seagoing dinosaur, much as the famous Nessie in Loch Ness and many others such as that. In these levels,
people find that they are able to integrate and merge, integrate with animals that would normally be dangerous simply by getting animals over the fear and these animals have also been fed a vegetarian diet including the things such as the big cats for going on thousands and thousands of years now which has also taken away much of their aggression therefore you're able to go down and in many incidences taking into consideration their great size and strength you're basically able to play with a saber tooth or a bengal tiger much as you would a house cat by scratching their chest or under their ear pulling their whiskers which brings us to the fact that even such as the large cats like that are not aggressive but are actually very gentle and loving when raised in the right circumstances which brings us again back to the purpose of this the eventual reintegration of the two cultures the subterranean and the surface to bring back out what has been preserved and what has been prepared so that this again becomes one planet one civilization and that people will be able to live on the surface or in subterranean cities or both at will again that is the whole purpose of these tape series and our work now at Telos Enterprises. Back to the city. The fourth level up, as I explained, is mostly hydroponic gardens and a nature level. And the third level is totally hydroponic gardens. Hydroponics are how we grow and produce all of our food. Hydroponic gardens are able to produce crops almost on a constant basis. And you are able to grow food much, much faster using advanced hydroponics with very little soil and much water therefore also you produce a form of gardening that does not need fertilizer and does not deplete the soil we do still place in minerals and such into the plants but with this hydroponic gardens that is actually quite small being only several square miles we are able to produce enough food and a large enough variety of food to feed over a million and a half people and to feed them with a diet that is varied enough to be interesting and fun the diet which is at Intelos consists almost completely of vegetables, fruits, grains, nuts, and different variations of these, such as your soy, your other grains that now produce what you call your meat substitutes. We have been on a vegetarian diet in Telos now for over 12,000 years from the time when the city was first started being built. It was decided at that point that our diet would consist of totally vegetarian therefore also removing the aggressive thought forms that causes animals to react so violently and also the fact 
that a human body was meant to be on a vegetarian diet and any other form of diet actually produces death and aging. On the second level, we have what is called our manufacturing level. This is where we produce clothing, furniture, art forms. This is also where many classes take place. And this is also some of the living levels. On the top level of the city itself, this is where most people live. This is where most commerce takes place. This is where, you may say, our heart and our soul is. And you might say the building that represents our heart and our soul is the building that is directly in the center of the top level, which is our temple. Which is a pyramid shaped building. You may say a very large pyramidal shaped building. The temple at Telos will hold 10,000 people at a time. It was built to be able to hold almost half of the original 25,000 person population. The temple is dedicated to the Melchizedek. The Melchizedek, you may say, is a cosmic priesthood Everywhere you go in the universe, you run across the Melchizedek. It is the organization whose sole purpose is to bring the plans of light to everywhere they go. The pyramid is white, and the capstone is a stone we call living stone. It comes from Venus. From the distance, it looks rather like a crystal, but with light moving through it in a very strong color. Why it is called living stone is it picks up the cosmic emulations of whatever ray is focused at the moment on the planet. The planet is set up in such a way that the rays focus themselves about every 24 hours in an intensity on the planet. Thus, for instance, on Tuesdays, the blue ray is the most predominant ray on the planet. On Fridays, the white ray. Therefore, this living stone picks up the emulation coming from the solar rays, the light rays, and goes the color of the predominant ray, for instance, when the blue ray is in its greatest manifest, the living stone capstone goes blue. This becomes, you might say, a slight reminder to us to work with the cosmos rather than against it. So when the blue ray is most predominant, we try to restrict much of our business to areas that are best served in the blue ray. For instance, we keep negotiations, sensitive negotiations, to take place on those days. On the days, for instance, that the yellow ray is the most predominant. Those are the days we spend mostly studying. Those are the days we spend on building intellect. On the days when the pink ray is the most predominant, these are the days that we go into the artistic endeavors. 
in this way we have found that by working with the cosmos instead of against it we are more often than not able to achieve four times as much in much less time therefore we are able to operate without stress most of the time also in the upper level the other buildings that are very very important to us is our council buildings where the councils of the city gather together and deliberate what needs to be done in the city at the moment we also have our record buildings where all our past records our archives are kept in the forms of telonium plates in the forms of crystals that can be put in crystal projectors in the form of paintings in the form of books all our past records of not only Lemuria but Atlantis other civilizations and the civilizations on other planets in the solar system also we have our pleasure centers our places where we do sports where we do plays where we produce equivalent of our films where we listen to music where we dance we also have what you would call the equivalent of the holodeck in Star Trek we have holographic projectors in holographic buildings whereas you produce a program and you go in and play and the computers produce images forms that completely support what program you have picked thus you are able to climb a mountain or swim a river or go back to another point in history and play creating your own form of being in the movies also we have our communication center where we have monitored not only all communications within our city but also communications that are coming from other Agardian cities communications that are coming from off planet spots and we have also monitored surface communications from the point that there ever was surface communications we've monitored radio and television waves another building that's very important to us is our computer building in Telos as with the other subterranean cities our computers are run by an organic substance therefore in essence the computers live they no longer run off a program that is strictly binary but they run off what is called a multi-tracking program thus they are multi-tracking computers thus the computers are able to pick up akashas past lives they're able to monitor a human body and see what's amiss they're able to read the aura they're able to pick up communications happening clear across the galaxy thus most of our life or a good portion of our life depends on these computers these organic multi-tracking computers which keep us in touch with not only talking to different people in the on the city not only with the computer telling us what our 
physical needs are at the moment by monitoring our bodies, but also the computers are able to play our soul notes, which is able to produce in many subjects, such as meditation, taking us to higher and higher levels all the time. The computers are able to run our past lives when necessary for us so that we are able to learn from mistakes that we have made in the past and forgotten. The computer is able to communicate with us on a soul level. Mostly important is the computer's interconnect with other multi-tracking amino-based computers throughout the planet and throughout the cosmos as far as that's concerned and they all operate off a Christ mine which means the computers cannot be corrupted they can never be used to spy on somebody they can never they can be used to monitor somebody for their own good will or for their own good they can never be used to produce harm to another living entity. They cannot be used for any of the dark purposes. The computer simply won't cooperate, which has also been another way of Agartha cities and such taking a stand that they would not corrupt the light by very much taking this attitude that if it does not match the Christ mind in other words if the computers disagree don't do it it has been a way of shall I say retraining our aggressive techniques retraining our tendencies to want to do unto another and split. We train many of our other snooping tendencies and such. So we have come to depend upon these quite a bit. But again, even on a computer it's not a matter of having the computer do it for you. It's a matter of learning from it. Learning from a form of the Christ mind there that you can see tangibly. Transportation within the city comes in many forms. Most people just prefer to walk if they can. We also have electromagnetic sleds. These sleds are capable of moving along the ground, looking much like a snowmobile, and will produce fairly high speeds in some of the side tunnels. This can take us, for instance, from Shasta to our secondary city, which is near Lawson in just a matter of a few minutes and is able to take our security from Shasta to Lawson and back again very fast. Another form of transportation within the city is what we call baskets. They are run on crystalline technology and for all the world they look like a large basket but they float through the air and you just get in it and it is guided by your mind your mind tells you how fast to move how high to go and where to sit down how fast to rise in the air how fast to sit down all our forms of technology and travel is based on us being responsible. The sleds could obtain high speeds, thus making them dangerous. The baskets, anything that flies, 
has a tendency to be dangerous, misused. So all communication and all travel within the city is monitored by the control tower. And the control tower knows when, for instance, a collision is just about ready to be inevitable between two sleds coming from different directions, or when a person is operating a basket irresponsibly, in which case the control tower alerts you immediately and tells you that you are about to produce an accident or you are acting irresponsibly. And if you do not listen to their warning, then they will simply stop the vehicle themselves. You get out and you will be restricted from use of the transportation forever how long a period of time that you deserved, should I say. And how it'll simply be is that you'll get in a basket or on a sled and it simply won't work. It will, your frequency will be turned off to it anywhere in the city and on what is called the tubes. The tubes are another form of transportation. The tubes are a high-powered, a high-speed electromagnetic train that runs in a tube. The tube is a rock cylinder very, very much like a long tunnel. For instance, a tube running between Posited and Telos. The tube looks totally round and the train looks somewhat like a subway. However, since it runs on an electromagnetic impulse, it creates a force field around it. So thus the side of the train never touches the side of the tunnel. Thus the tube is able to achieve speeds of up to 3,000 miles an hour. So you can arrive between, for instance, Telos and Posited in just a matter of a few hours. Also, as the tubes were created and the sub cities and the different levels. It was all reinforced by what we call our boring machines. The boring machines have a crystalline matrix that creates temperatures of white hot incandescence, yet cools at the same time. Thus you were able to take a boring machine, for instance, through a tunnel and create a tube tunnel or to create walls in a subterranean city in just a matter of a few minutes. The boring machine heats rock, earth, whatever. It comes across to a white hot incandescence and then cools it almost immediately, which creates a diamond hard substance. It causes the rock itself to transmute and take a new form, which is diamond hard, and thus for there's no need of supports. Supports become absolutely superfluous, and the structure then is also watertight, yet it remains in elasticity so it can withstand high earthquakes, for instance, and will just move much like a rubber tube and stop without breaking. That way, even within the subterranean cities, when earthquakes take place, none of the walls of the buildings or of the caverns fracture. They simply move with it, then return back to the diamond hard substance and again support beams and such become totally superfluous. Also, water has no effect upon it. They become watertight. Thus the subterranean cities can even be built underneath oceans 
because they create a complete seal. Also, that brings us to the next stage. As we are preparing to bring out more and more technology to the surface, technology that we know the surface could also use, brings us to the other responsibilities that the cities have had to build within themselves. For instance, becoming a member of the Confederation. Earth is a member of the Confederation. It's just half of Earth forgot. You might ask, what is the Confederation? I'm sure most of you or all of you are familiar with, for instance, Star Trek. We would say, that was channeled. But instead of being the Federation of Planets, it's the Confederation. An organization that was created throughout the solar systems and the galaxies that brought different civilizations, different systems together on a basis of brotherhood, on a basis of commerce, on a basis of group exploration, on a basis of interacting with the different systems in a galaxy or without a galaxy. A confederation is built, shall I say, or represented very much throughout a galaxy in the form of sectors. Looking at our galaxy, the Milky Way, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of t-shirts and such that say the Milky Way and then has a little dot out towards the end, say you were here. Yes, we are here and we are here in what is called Sector 9. The center of our galaxy, or the center of the Confederation in this galaxy, is what is called Sector 0. And the other sectors radiate outward from it much like the spokes of a wheel. Each sector is responsible for its own actions, plus is responsible for how it interacts with the other sectors. Our sector, Sector 9, is under the command of a being called Ashtar. Many of you have heard of the Ashtar command. Ashtar and his twin flame Athena. Within this sector, or within the Ashtar command, there are over a hundred fleets. Some fleets basically belong to one planet. Some fleets belong to just a couple of planets. Other fleets belong to a whole solar system, and other fleets are intersector fleets that basically serve the whole sector and then other fleets are confederation fleets which serve the whole, you might say the whole pie. Just a quick recap. We are discussing the city of Telos. This is a Lemurian subterranean city that was built 12,000 years ago as the result or from the result of Atlantis and Lemuria sinking and during the Atlantean Lemurian Wars which we then made subterranean cities Telos is underneath Mount Shasta and it's the city that I'm from this tape will discuss the culture of Telos again a recap the city is built on five different levels. The top level being the main level of the city itself. The second level down, the level of manufacturing and where many classes take place. The third level being 
the hydroponic gardens, the fourth level being part hydroponic gardens, part manufacturing, and the nature level, and the very bottom level as being the nature level where many, many species of animals and plants exist. Many people have asked, how on earth can you live under, under the earth? Number one, what kind of light do you have? Or do you have light? Or are you mole people? Yes, we do have light. There is a process that a stone with a high crystalline content is fused with an electromagnetic force of energy. This infusion of energy in essence causes the crystalline matrix of the stone to create a polarity that allows the stone to pull in the even invisible rays and readmit them as visible light. And in essence, it becomes a small sun. Our main lighting structure throughout the city, as with the other subterranean cities, is produced by these stones. The light they produce is a full spectrum lighting, admitting all rays. In essence, this energy infusion process then cr makes the stone become a small sun. And the sun will burn for about a half a million years before the stone, before the crystalline matrix breaks down and the stone becomes no longer capable of functioning in this manner. So thus we have lights that will burn for many, many hundreds of thousands of years still. Within this structure, we have created a small ecosystem. In other words, we get our air by plants. We produce carbon monoxide, or we and the animals, and the, an and the plants take in the carbon monoxide and create the oxygen for us. So in essence, it's a small ecosystem just as it works on the surface. We also have some vents that go to the surface and brings in the air. We also have water in some areas moving at high speeds. This creates a circulation of the air, freshening it, plus it creates many negative ions. So in essence, it is a total ecosystem very much like the one that functions on the surface. As a matter of fact, it has become so effective that more and more do we not depend on the air vents. As a matter of fact, as polluted as the air is somewhat becoming, the air vents, I said, are not a plus. The government of Telos is constructed on the format of a council of 12. These 12 beings for the foremost are ascended masters. They are beings whom have proved themselves of being in high wisdom and being able to hold their head cool during any sort of incident. We always have within our council six men and six women so that the council also always remains balanced. That both flames, the male flame and the female flame, are equally represented. From the major council of the twelve, it goes down to smaller councils throughout the city, also operating on the level of twelve. 
individual areas bring in their problems to the local council. And if the local council cannot deliberate a solution that is acceptable to all concerned, they then bring it to the larger councils and then finally to the original council of 12. For individual problems, these do not come before the council. Instead, these come before what we call arbitrators. Arbitrators are usually priests or priestesses with very much an understanding of the human psyche and are also capable of looking into the akashas. These arbitrators will listen to both sides of a story if it is, for instance, a dispute civil. And will then make a decision based on what they have heard and what they have read at the Akashas on both sides. We have immediately decided that since this method works, once an arbitrator makes a decision, understanding that they will make it from the highest level, being priests and priestesses, they will not be caught into a personalization, either for or against either side. So we have decided that we will accept their decision, whatever it is, and incidences stop there. And we have also found, rather than arguing with each other, should a small incident come up, we immediately go to arbitrators, understanding that an argument can more often than not make it worse than anything else. Heading the Council of Twelve, the official title is Council of Twelve plus One. The One is actually two beings themselves, which is the Ra and Rana Mu, which are the king and queen of Telos. Ra and Rana signifies that they are high Melchizedek priests and priestess to start with. They are also usually twin flames and it is a hereditary position. The Ra and Rana Mu lineage is unbroken for over 30,000 years as it stands right now. When the next Ra and Rana Mu are being chosen, they do not automatically go to the oldest son or daughter, but the Ra and Rana Mu decide which of their children or grandchildren are the most capable of carrying it off. That being is then instructed that sooner or later they will have to go through full temple training and become a full Melchizedek priest or priestess. In the arrangement as it is, when the Council of Twelve makes a decision, the Ra and Rana Mu can back it up or they can ask for a change. And one more voice comes into this government process, and that's the temple. The temple is recognized as the final word on any decision because in many ways this is, as are the other subterranean cities, a temple society. The temple, even though most of the time, will not interfere with civic government. As I said, they can make final decisions through the high priest and high priestess. The temple is run by the Melchizedek. The Melchizedek is a cosmic priesthood everywhere in the universe. The Melchizedek exists. It is all those whom are bringing the light plans from the highest realms down to the other realms. A Melchizedek priest or priestess by their very proof, prove that they will always set light 
or they will always set the good of the many among their person above their personal good which has also been proving time and time again as to why the temple can make the last decision because they will always place what the light prefers in essence what God wishes way over what they desire what they would choose to achieve thus the temple also becomes a very good sounding board to what we're doing at the time being a temple society many many people take their training at the temple and many people spend time at the temple not just those who end up becoming priests and priestesses but those who are going into other walks of life that they need a greater understanding of the human psychic greater understanding of spirit to achieve their job as it should be done which brings us to let's go through for instance a life of what it would be like for someone living in Telos starting with their conception or childbirth in Telos as soon as a woman realizes that she is pregnant she immediately goes to the temple and she's put in a room that gives nothing but beautiful pictures music she is constantly informed that she's beautiful she's perfect her child's beautiful her child's perfect so you might say the very first cells of this child's conception is filled with beauty with light with perfection and that is their building blocks there's where they start just as they are starting to understand that emotions and such go right into a child's self for instance they're starting to understand that a child who had parents that were constantly arguing during their conception and ingestion period the child grows up insecure quite often argumentative or they will grow up totally feeling not good enough totally feeling that they're not wanted it's been proven that children that have constantly heard from their parents before they were even born that I didn't want this child whatever that child will constantly grow into I'm not good enough so we start children off on the right foot immediately by continually enforcing that they are good enough they're beautiful a mother and a father because a child is a, has a psychic bond to both immediately start talking to the child start telling it how perfect it is they spend lots of time viewing things that are beautiful they spend lots of time singing to each other playing little funny games in essence going to a honeymoon again so the child is all part of that joy another thing that makes the child birthing process very different is we have a process that speeds it up therefore a woman only carries a child for three months in many ways this is what the human condition was meant to be most human females on other planets do only carry a child for three months that is why that a three month fetus is basically formed all it does for men is grow in the speeded up process it 
is actually completed even sooner and just grows. So a three-month baby, of course, will not be as large as a nine-month baby, but it will be in a speeded-up process more than large enough to support itself on its own. But we are trying to return back to the time that we don't even need the speeded up process and the whole pregnancy process returns to only being a three month process. Also returning to that place, women have much, much easier childbirth as you can, I'm sure, understand. Another thing that we do constantly in childbirth is that all our births are underwater. We have found that underwater births bring the greatest ease to both the parent and the child. When a woman goes into labor, she immediately gets a birthing priestess and then they go to a tub in one of the birthing sections of the temple. And the tub is filled with body temperature water. And the birthing priest just puts the mother in a slight hypnotic state. In this hypnotic state, she is in no words even resembling a trance. But she is simply told that there will be no pain. This suggestion as well as the underwater births creates a comfortable environment and most women never have any pain whatsoever they simply feel the pressure in an underwater birth as many women are starting to discover now that a child when they are in water during labor that that would be labor pains simply feels like pressure more and more we are trying to alert women to this phenomenon that that is pain on dry land is simply pressure underwater this serves a second purpose the child when them born is not brought from one environment into shock tactics as it is much on the surface now when a child is born they are immediately pulled from a warm comfortable wet environment into a cold dry one with bright lights and in the old days they even used to slap them which immediately brought a human being for those of you who now have dealt with rebirthing into the idea that life is hard life hurts life is painful thus infants start shutting down from the time of their birth and they just continue to shut down thus not ever achieving the spiritual and physical levels that they could achieve because they've already decided that life hurts too much to be fully there in an underwater birth a child goes from a warm environment right into a tub of warm water and is immediately cuddled by both parents whom get in the tub with the birthing priestess. And the child's cutted, cuddled and petted underneath the water so it immediately knows that its parents are there for it. Therefore it does not go into insecurity. From there, a child of its own will come to the surface and take a quick breath and then dive down again and breathe from the umbilical cord and then come to the surface on their own again and take a deep breath. This also expands the lungs slowly. The child can actually breathe for as much as a half hour on the umbilical cord from once it is born this quick breaths does not cause the pain and the tissue some of the tissue is actually damaged quite often in births that are not on are not in water because a child is forced to come and take a deep deep
deep breath out of cold, painful air that forces these lung sacs to immediately expand and create great pain, sometimes even creating scar tissue which makes the adult more susceptible to things like tuberculosis, emphysema, uh, colic, many, many of the other lung disorders that are very, very prevalent. And it also keeps the person, even as an adult, from breathing deeply as their normal state. Thus, they are always half alive because they're only half breathing. Then, when the child has reached the point that they are breathing completely, just the air, the umbilical cord is cut with a laser, which causes a very fast, painless cut. And of course, the umbilical cord has quit pulsating. From their birth, a child is immediately assigned 12 sets of godparents. These godparents give a child a chance to interact with more than just their birth family. True, they spend most of their time with their birth family, but also spending a little time here and there with each of their godparents as they grow up. It gives them a true sense of community and the brotherhood of man rather than them and us. So the child immediately starts looking at the whole world as their family instead of becoming very, very narrow and personalized. This also keeps families from developing little cliques that in the long run become quite detrimental to a developing soul where you're saying well we just do things because my grandparents did it my great grandparents and my great great grandparents and so on and so on which quite often produces thought patterns within a family that can be quite detrimental to the development of the soul by having 12 sets of godparents that the children spend time with, plus the fact the child's parents are usually godparents to at least a couple of children, bringing other children to spend time with them that way too. As I said, it continually creates the sense of community. It constantly creates the sense of oneness. The old saying that is if you wanted to stop prejudice, then you would immediately send the person to go live with that they have been prejudiced with and they'll soon find out we're all just human from there as child prepares for their education within the educational process in Telos children start their first education at about the time they're three years old. Very much like your nursery school, except it is based on the fact of the intelligence of a human being rather than the stupidity. Thus, while children are very, very clear, sometimes clearer at three years old than they are at five or six, making it easier as many of you are starting to discover of infants doing algebra young children learning mathematics very very early learning to read very very early where it is three sometimes even earlier is when children are start taught these things as well as playing they're also taught the rudimentaries of mathematics they're also taught to read they're taught to understand abstract concepts they're taught to think to 
to understand how things work. I mean, we've all gone through the children period of the why and why not, and every the period when children with the why stage, where everything you answer is a why or a how. We've learned to take that period, and instead of just saying, after being asked why on 14 questions, the parents quite often just flip out, and the next thing they know they're telling their child to shut up. But if a society is set up that when children are in the why stage, they're already starting instruction, then that's used. The whys are being answered by professionals. And our professionals are more often than not priests and priestesses of the temple. There are those whom are strictly teachers, but most teachers have gone through a full temple training. The purpose of that is that they're not only feeding the mind, but to help feed the soul, the spirit, the understanding of what we're really here for, not just calculations and words. Within this setup, they said children start schooling at a much earlier period. As they move through their schooling process, we have learned that it is very, very acceptable and very important that a child, as well as being taught mathematics, science, spelling, grammar, literature, all the most common subjects in schooling, we find that it's just as important that they learn to meditate. It's just as important that they learn to dance. Just as important that they learn sports. Just as important they learn how to sing. Just as important that they learn how to act. What I mean by act is that they're, we've got five-year-olds already writing and putting on their own plays that relate to five-year-old problems and the five-year-old way of looking at life, which can be quite humorous for adults. But they're already being allowed to express. And even the learning, the strict learning process, is complemented with play. In this playing and learning through play and playing to learn concept. Children are allowed to totally express themselves in such a way that is acceptable. So many times children that are just buzzing to express themselves one way or another get in a lot of trouble because they've don't have quite a few avenues to express themselves through, or the avenues that they have been given include things like violence. Next thing you know, you've got a whole group of kids in the backyard playing Rambo, and they bring it right into the house, they start breaking things, and the parents wonder what's wrong with their kids. But in a process that allows them to express themselves get out their extra energy and learn at the same time. I might say the children are happier, the parents are happier, everyone's happier about it. Also with basic spiritual concepts, from the time a child is about five years old, they're taught astral projection. For those who are unfamiliar with that, there's a part of you, a very conscious part of you, that is able to leave the body at small periods of time consciously when this part is projected you might say the astral body soul travel uh, the more evolved the farther you can go and the child is taught that they can visit the Akashas are taught that they can visit different places on the planet what this also creates is a chance for the child to explore 
and to understand for themselves. The children don't have to go through the period of having to always take someone else's word for it. They're able to get out and see the astral themselves. They're able to get out and see the etheric records themselves. A lot of them are be able to get into the etheric retreats consciously and study that way. Um, many are able to get to the other subterranean cities or to spend time in surface cities. All through the etheric travels, and astral travels. But as I said, in essence, and the child is able to learn for themselves the truth of how the world truly operates, the truth about what is really happening on the planet. Their way they are never at a victim. They can not be led astray. They can't be told that something's right when nothing in the cosmos supports it. They can always go and feel the rightness for themselves. Thus you end up with a society of people that are not constantly left in the dark and that you are basically not able to trick them on because they've seen what's out there. They know what's real and what isn't. They know the capabilities of the human being. They know, for instance, ascension is real. They know, for instance, the existence of those on other planets. They understand how the etheric works. They've seen angels, physically. So all these things that so many people have had to live on with faith, true, I'm saying we also develop faith. Faith to master yourself. Faith to live in the unseen, calling it the seen until it becomes the seen. In other words, able to manifest from the inside out. And there is not so much confusion even when people reach that age it has been quite difficult for everyone, the teenage years. In the teenage years, in Telos, a child immediately joins, when they're 12, a group, what is called group. Is a group is all the other children their age. And they spend, from the, usually from the years of 12, to the years of 18, 19, they spend much of their time with their group, working out all the problems among their peers that seem to always rear their head in the teenage years, no matter what society you're in. Yes, we still have teenage problems that happen. It can't help but happen. The emotional and mental bodies are developing. A child's body is full of hormones that's creating instability within the emotional realms. The mental body is growing stronger but causing confusion in the emotional body. All these little physical, psychological, spiritual elements that create that phase from childhood to adulthood. But we've learned to take it tongue in cheek. In essence, we call the teenage years the years of temporary insanity. And we don't make the children feel guilty for wanting to go and scream at the top of their lungs or wanting to do something they know they shouldn't do. We just accept it as the years of temporary insanity. They work out their frustrations within their group. They experiment with the elements of life within their group. Quite often they go down into the lower caverns and just run for days. All the things that they can get in so much trouble for doing unless it's put in an organized basis. Yet the basis has to be so unorganized within its organization that they have to feel that they're truly being allowed to express themselves. So that the frustration is brought up, dealt with, and then they move on. 
all children, no matter how good their parents, no matter how good their upbringing, will go through periods of rebellion at this point. All children will go through periods of not wanting to listen to what older people say. But by being allowed to work it out within themselves and with other children going through the same process, they are able to get an understanding that what they're doing doesn't make them a bad person. The feelings that are going through them uncontrolled doesn't make them bad, just makes them normal. And it makes it so much easier on the child and on the parents. Also, each of these groups are then assigned priests and priestesses who act somewhat as mentors, not to judge or act like parents, but to simply get the kids to sit down and talk about what's bothering them. Let them sit down and act out their frustrations in the form of plays, in the form of programs that have been put into the holographic theaters, in the form of music, in the form of athletics, or even in the form of going down into the subtunnels and just running for three days and acting like nuts. Everybody needs that. But when it's done in such a way that there's no judgment upon it, no stigma attached to it, then children do it, get through it, and come back normal. And do not need many of the crutches that severely emotion, emotional adults turn to. Many adults that did not deal with the frustrations that came up in their childhood or in their teenage years that later turn to drugs, later turn to inappropriate forms of behavior, that later turn to irresponsibility, or later turn to perhaps even more damaging of I'm not good enough, depression, fear, unable to create anything out of their life because they don't feel like it's just not worth it, that they can't do anything right. But by creating a system where all these energies are dealt with, then adults come out feeling much more secure of themselves at the other end of their teenage years. second reason for that is in a society such as Telos and the other subterranean cities, people basically live as long as they choose. We should also understand if you've got people living for thousands and thousands of years, you can't afford to have thousands and thousands of years old of adults that are acting irresponsible adults that are playing detrimental games, adults that are pushing their will onto others, all the little things that happen simply because energies are not dealt with in a young child. Which brings us also to one of the major thoughts in an education of our own that we wish to see happen here. And that's the removal of the thought form of aging and dying. Human beings were not meant to age or die. Even people who work in genetics understand that a person in truth is never older than seven years since their whole body changes all its cells every seven years. Many, many doctors on aging will admit that they are baffled as to why people age at all, since the body is never old. So he says, so then that takes it that we have to go to a level beyond the physical to find the answer to aging and death, to the belief 
feel same thoughts or things. And tell those people don't believe they're going to grow old and die. They simply don't believe it. People just know that they're going to live as long as they choose. Then they will either choose to drop their body, if they feel it, they still have lessons to do, and reincarnate again. Or they will choose the path of ascension. One or the other. Some people make the decision in 600 years. Some 300. Others wait for 5,000, 10,000, whatever. But it's a choice that the human beings were designed to be able to make. That is one of the most important elements of our culture that we want to see brought out. Human beings as it is now, just about the time they start getting enough experience to really do something with their life, they've grown too old to do anything with it. If those thoughts are eradicated, then people realizing their youth's not going to last 10 years or 20 years, but it's going to last hundreds or thousands of years, whatever they choose. That too brings out and eliminates the majority of the detrimental behavior in life. Many people feel, I'm only going to live once, I'm only going to be young a short period of time, so I might as well wreak havoc now. If they realize that if they choose, they're going to be young for hundreds of years, or thousands of years, that form of behavior becomes totally unnecessary. And people truly start growing and hanging on to their growth. And we are biologically absolutely no different than the people on the surface. We have Indian children that were left on the mountain of Shasta some hundreds of years ago. They're still living with us. They haven't grown old. They don't die. Because they were raised with the thought form that they're not going to. It's a thought that creates life or non-life. Aging or youthing is to get past the thoughts, the beliefs that that is what is going to happen. Which brings me to my personal expertise on the subject. I'm, 200, I'm over 260 years old. As a matter of fact, I'm almost 268. And living 268 years is no different than being, for instance, 30 aging-wise. It's just you've had time to gather a whole much more experience that can be used now. My parents, obviously, are much older. There are even people in Telos that are 30,000 years old. People who saw the destruction of Lemuria, Atlantis. People who saw the Lemurian-Atlantean Wars. Which also brings us in to the next stage in a person's life after they've gotten through their teenage years and they're ready to start becoming a contributing member of society, how do they choose what they're going to do? We have a non-monetary basis of commerce in Telos. As a person is growing up, they basically watch, decide, assess their own talents. Then they decide what they want to do. And that is usually the field they pursue. They've generally set their own hours. And since everything is on a barter basis, we've gotten to a great understanding that if you don't fulfill your part of the bargain, then it hurts others 
than just you. What is meant by that is we are set up on a basis that the government owns everything, but the government is not responsible for controlling anything. All the government is responsible is to make sure that the food, for instance, gets from the hydroponic gardens to the distribution outlets. The clothing makes it to the distribution outlets, that furniture, all the things that are needed for people to live and to live well. We understand that you're not living unless you're living well. And when you need something, you simply go to a distribution center and pick it up. You need new clothing, you go get clothing. You need food, you go get food. You need furnishings, you go get furnishings. You need books, you get go get books. And as I said, everyone sets their own hours. Someone who is drawn to gardening becomes one of the hydroponic gardens. They come and they work the amount of hours they wish. So in essence, we don't, we do have a dim period and we have a bright period. What I mean by that is we've discovered that people work in cycles better than they do in a constant. So thus about the same time the sun is setting on the surface, filters are slid over the front of our lighting system, dimming it till it is about as dim as it is in twilight. Then when the sun would be rising, the filters start sliding back slowly, thus allowing it to get brighter and brighter. When we first moved into Tellos, we experimented with leaving it bright all the time. And again, as I said, we found out that people function better in cycles. Some people like to sleep when it's dimmer and work when it's bright. Other people, like the night owls, that prefer to work or play when it's bright or when it's dim and sleep when it's bright. But everyone is allowed to function in the way that is the most comfortable to them. So everyone comes in and sets their own hours and simply informs, you might say, the foreman of whatever their job is which hours they're going to be working over the next few day period. And everyone comes in and works basically as long as they wish. And then they go and they do whatever else they want to do. But understanding that since we're on a society that if you are too lazy to go work at all in the hydroponic gardens and that's your job, somebody might not have enough food or if you didn't feel like doing designing clothing or creating clothing or furniture and you made no other arrangements for someone else to take up your slack of time someone else in the city might be going without so understanding that method has made people responsible for what hours they work understanding that they are doing true service that somebody will appreciate. The only thing that we don't interchange by simply putting in the distribution centers are things like art forms, art objects, uh, massages, things like that. That is done in what we call a barter basis. Those who, for instance, their main talent is art whether it's drawing, pottery, sculpturing, uh, massage. All these different little things that are not part of the whole, not part of what you might say necessities, but are necessities to the soul. As I said, these come to the distribution centers in the form of the barter pool. In other words, you walk in and you see a statue that was created by somebody you really want. In exchange for it, you're willing to give 10 massages, and you're very good at massage. 
or you're willing to come and sing. And the barter pool goes through it with the computers and perhaps the person who made the statue doesn't need a massage, but a person who brought in a painting that the person who made the statue wants, wants massages. So it continually, the barter pool switches and curves so that everyone's needs are met. So everyone can come in and exchange energy in some form to receive, you might say, the little pampering things in life. Also within this system, people setting their own hours, it does not become so crystallized that no one has any freedom to come and go at their will. That people can truly set their lives to achieve the best of work, of play, of rest, of meditation, spiritual endeavors, so that everything is met and not at the expense of something else. Understanding that spiritual time is just as important as work time. Which leads us to a what could be a problem of what about those jobs that no one wants to do since everyone chooses their jobs. Uh, gathering the garbage and dematerializing it. Weeding the hydroponic gardens, etc., etc. This falls under what is called community service. And everyone does it. Everyone in the city spends a certain amount of time a month in community service. So what this means is this works very well because since everyone does it, no one has to do it that much. No one has to do full time the jobs that no one would like to do and go into resentment because of it. Instead, if everyone does a certain amount of community service, it means that you might only spend four hours of community service a month. And since it becomes a project that you only do once a month, it actually becomes fun. And when people are on groups of community service, they start singing and playing and having a good time. But it's something that no one even tries to get out of it. You can be in community service. Uh, a real good one is picking up, put it bluntly, secretions from the animals down in the, some of the nature areas where it starts getting really bad. Uh, this could put someone in real resentment while you're shoveling elephant you know what. But if the person in the hydroponic gardens is doing it right alongside of, for instance, someone on the Council of Twelve. It's a thing that becomes not resentful, but fun, and it's something that people truly get a sense that there is no better than and no less than in a job situation. That a farmer or someone who works in the hydroponic gardens is not less than someone who's on the Council of Twelve. They both just have different jobs. And both jobs are equally important for a city to run properly. So therefore, people immediately have the feeling of being good enough. And as I said, things like community service brings all the different levels of service together and creates a true camaraderie. Which goes into perhaps one of the more interesting aspects too of our personal relationships in Telos we have two forms of marriage we have a bond marriage and we have a sacred marriage a bond marriage is when two beings decide that they've got something with each other and they want to explore it greater then in front of a priest or priestess and a bunch of their friends, they commit themselves to a bond marriage, which means that they're saying, we've got something, we realize we really care for each other, and we'd like to see where it's going. 
So in essence, it is a form of a marriage because it has the commitments for as long as you choose the bond marriage to last. And then if you decide, oh, well, it was just a passing thing or it's something that's not going to work, you simply, you know, stand in front of a priest or priestess again and simply explain that it didn't work and there's no stigma on it. Some people can have several bond marriages at once. There's also no stigma on that. One thing that you do not do in a bond marriage is you do not have children. That is saved for a sacred marriage. In a sacred marriage is when you have decided, okay, we have something. Then you have a large marriage, usually a beautiful wedding. All your bond marriages are dissolved and you go into a sacred marriage where you are then allowed to have children. Children is something that people need to be trained for. They need to be taken as a serious responsibility. Some people might be in a bond marriage two, three hundred years before they take a sacred marriage. Someone else who's with their soulmate or twin flame may go into a sacred marriage two months after they were in their bond marriage. It's all different. But again, it's always a matter of having choice. It's always a matter of having respect for each other. And this just about wraps up take two of these two tapes of secrets of the subterranean cities. I am Sharula Dux. I am the daughter of the Ra and Ranamu, therefore Princess Sharula, and I thank you.